Bonsoir à toutes et à tous. Je, je commence pendant que notre intervenant s'installe. Euh, bienvenue dans l'auditorium Jacqueline Einstein à l'occasion de ce deuxième événement que nous organisons dans le cadre du Forum culturel pour l'Ukraine, un forum qui est organisé en partenariat avec la réunion des musées métropolitains Rouen-Normandie et appuyé par de nombreuses autres institutions. Donc vous avez pu entendre le 14 mars Jannick Durand à propos des premiers édifices chrétiens de Kiev et nous avons ce soir une conférence sur un sujet bien différent puisqu'on parlera art contemporain. Alors que l'Ukraine est envahie, nous avons pris l'initiative avec Sylvain Amic, directeur de la réunion des musées métropolitains ou en Normandie, de mettre en place ce forum culturel pour l'Ukraine afin de faire vivre la culture et le patrimoine ukrainien menacé. Donc c'est bien sûr d'abord un cycle de conférences sur l'archéologie, l'histoire de l'art, le patrimoine ukrainien, mais c'est aussi pour l'INHA l'occasion d'exprimer sa solidarité avec le peuple ukrainien dans sa lutte contre l'invasion. Et l'INHA témoigne ainsi donc son soutien à toutes celles, toutes ceux qui, en Biélorussie et en Russie, se mobilisent contre le forfait perpétré en leur nom. Au-delà de ce forum, à l'INHA, nous participons également au dispositif POSE, qui est un dispositif d'urgence mis en place avec le Collège de France pour l'accueil de, de chercheurs euh, voilà, pour, pour trois mois dans un premier lieu en France. Nous dédions aussi un appel spécifique aux chercheurs invités ukrainiens. Donc cet appel est en ligne jusqu'au 30 mars sur notre page web. Et puis sur notre, toujours sur notre page d'accueil du site web, nous recensons les programmes de soutien aux artistes professionnels de la culture et chercheurs ukrainiens. Donc n'hésitez pas à vous renseigner et à nous contacter directement. Nous essayons de, de mettre en réseau ceux qui le souhaitent et qui ont besoin de soutien. À l'occasion du Festival d'Histoire de l'Art à Fontainebleau, euh, les 4 et 5 juin, nous, nous organisons également des tables rondes et des débats autour de l'Ukraine et de sa culture. Vous trouverez également en salle La Brousse de notre bibliothèque une sélection d'ouvrages sur l'histoire de l'art et le patrimoine ukrainien. Alors J'annonce euh, dès à présent les, les deux prochaines conférences qui auront lieu euh, à l'INHA dans le cadre de ce forum. La prochaine aura lieu le 23 mars à Rouen d'abord, puis le 25 mars à l'INHA. Euh, elle sera donnée par Nadia Bernard Kovalchuk, qui est doctorante à une Sorbonne Université, membre du Centre André Chastel, et qui nous parlera de l'école de photographie de Kharkiv. La semaine suivante, le 28 mars à Paris, puis le 30 mars à Rouen, nous entendrons Fabien Bella, qui est maître de conférence associé à l'École nationale supérieure d'architecture Val-de-Seine, et euh, sa conférence s'intitule « Kiev, les coulisses staliniennes, une reconstruction 1943-1956 ». Alors aujourd'hui, nous sommes heureux d'accueillir euh, à distance depuis la Californie où elle réside, Alissa Loshkina. Elle a dirigé le plus grand musée d'art contemporain d'Ukraine, le Mistetsky Arsenal, et elle a été rédactrice en chef de la revue « Art Ukraine ». Elle a publié en 2020, donc tout récemment, « Une révolution permanente, l'art ukrainien contemporain et ses racines, 1880-2020, aux éditions Nouvelle Place à Paris. » Elle va dialoguer avec Igor Sogologorski, donc qui est agrégé de philosophie, éditeur, traducteur, directeur de la collection « L'art à l'écrit » des éditions Nouvelle Place, et qui avait préfacé cet ouvrage, donc publié en 2020. La collection L'Art à l'écrit publie des écrits d'artistes et des travaux qui traitent d'espaces socioculturels répressifs. Igor Sokologorski est également membre du comité scientifique qui organise à l'INHA un cycle de conférences autour du conceptualisme moscovite. Et donc je vous invite également à participer à la prochaine conférence qui sera donnée par Thomas Clank et qui aura lieu cette fois bien en salle Vasari et pas à l'auditorium le jeudi 24 mars à 18h30. Donc ensemble, Alissa Loshkina et Igor Sokologorski présenteront les spécificités de l'art contemporain ukrainien, l'art ukrainien contemporain, pardon, et évoqueront la création des artistes d'Ukraine dans le contexte de la guerre qui ravage aujourd'hui ce pays. Alors merci beaucoup à tous deux de votre présence et je préviens le public que comme Alissa ne parle pas français, cette conférence se fera en bilingue, vous, vous échangerez en français et en anglais, mais je pense que notre public sera à l'aise pour vous suivre en anglais. Oui. Euh, donc avant de vous céder la parole, j'adresse quelques remerciements à l'ensemble des chercheurs et chercheuses qui ont accepté de participer à ce cycle en donnant une conférence, euh, à, à nos équipes à l'INHA qui ont organisé et conçu cet événement, et tout particulièrement Stéphane Gessler, chargé d'études et de recherche, 
et Victor Klaas, coordinateur scientifique, qui ont programmé euh, ces séances. Nous adressons donc aussi nos, nos remerciements aux chercheurs, chercheuses d'Ukraine, aux spécialistes de son histoire qui nous ont aidé à identifier les intervenants pour ces conférences. Et comme à chaque événement, nous remercions le service des manifestations, de la communication et notre régisseur Maxime Grell qui assure la captation de cet événement que vous pourrez revoir sur notre chaîne YouTube. Merci et bon dialogue. Merci beaucoup. Donc, merci d'être là en cette, ce début de week-end particulièrement ensoleillé. Euh, merci à tous ceux qui ont organisé ce, ce cycle ukrainien qui me semble vraiment euh, important euh, aujourd'hui. Euh, je, moi, j'interviens ici en tant qu'éditeur qu au sens anglais du terme, hein, puisque euh, il y a deux ans, nous avons sollicité Alissa pour un livre. Euh, L'idée, c'était de faire un livre de présentation de l'art contemporain ukrainien parce qu'on parlait déjà beaucoup de l'Ukraine, euh, d'un point de vue géopolitique, mais très peu euh, de la culture euh, des artistes euh, ukrainiens. Et donc on a commencé euh, euh, à réfléchir à ce livre, et on s'est rendu compte que finalement, euh, c'était très difficile de présenter les choses sans euh, exposer leur contexte historique. Et donc on a décidé de remonter en arrière, au fil du, du temps et euh, on s'est rendu compte que pour expliquer la situation contemporaine il fallait au moins remonter jusqu'à la fin du 19 e siècle, ce qu'a fait Alissa donc elle a produit cet ouvrage qui est une présentation à destination du public français euh, il y a une version ukrainienne mais qui est un peu différente, ce, ce livre il, était, il est conçu pour un public français c'est à dire pas forcément averti de ce qui se passe dans cette zone du monde euh, il peut être lu donc de deux manières, on peut le lire un peu à l'envers comme, comme il a été écrit, on, on peut le lire dans le cours chronologique. La première partie de, de cet exposé euh, sera consacrée justement bon, à cet art euh, contemporain ukrainien dans son, dans, son, dans son développement historique. Évidemment c'est une réalité extrêmement riche, plutôt que de faire un saupoudrage, on a choisi quatre, quatre aspects euh, euh, quatre aspects précis que, que l'on développera. D'abord, euh, euh, la, la postérité du, tableau, du fameux tableau d'Ilarépine, les Cosaques Zaporog. Ensuite, on parlera des spécificités ukrainiennes de, de l'avant-garde. Ensuite, euh, dans un troisième temps, de quelque chose de vraiment spécifiquement ukrainien, l'art populaire et sa dimension aussi euh, académique. Et enfin, quelque chose qui est peut-être plus connu, qui est vraiment ce que l'on connaît le plus de l'Ukraine, c'est l'école de photographie de Kharkiv et son renouveau au cours des années 2000. La deuxième partie de cet exposé sera quant à elle consacrée à l'engagement des artistes ukrainiens dans la guerre aujourd'hui. Et Alissa commentera six œuvres qui ont été produites euh, au cours des, des, derniers, des derniers jours, des dernières semaines, au cours de février-mars euh, 2022. Voilà, ce seront les deux parties de notre exposé. Alors, on va commencer avec euh, Ilia euh, Répine. Euh, donc, vous savez qu'il y a une exposition euh, Répine euh, bon, à Paris qui a, qui a eu énormément euh, de succès. Or, le peintre, il y a Répine, bon, si c'est un grand peintre de Saint-Pétersbourg, de la capitale de l'Empire des Tsars, était né euh, sur la terre d'Ukraine, près de Kharkiv. Il s'est de tout temps intéressé hein, à, ses, à ses origines, à cette, à cette région euh, du monde. Et euh, parmi ses œuvres les plus célèbres, il y a celles qui, sont, euh, celles, celles qui traitent en particulier de la réalité ukrainienne, de sa, de sa dimension historique et en particulier ce tableau, qui est peut-être le plus connu d'Ilia Répine, « Les Cossacks Zaporog écrivent une lettre au sultan turc ». So, Alisa, please, uh, maybe, uh, for the beginning, could you say something about this uh, ambiguous uh, personality of uh, Ilia Répine in the context of the Russian Empire? A few words. Thank you, Igor. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And uh, thank you for coming and joining us uh, tonight. Unfortunately, today we are like speaking about Ukrainian art in a very sad context. 
And it's very hard uh, not to think about uh, this wider context of the war in Ukraine. But even in spite of all these sad circumstances, I'm really happy to be here. And I'm really happy to present the book uh, that is uh, basically the joint effort between me and uh, the Nouvelle Edition uh, Plus uh, publishing house and personally Igor Sokologorsky. Because it was exactly Igor who inspired me to write this book. And it was exactly the publishing house that that uh, somehow gave me this uh, inspiration to, to think about the wider context of the Ukrainian uh, contemporary art and its roots. Uh, because when we decided to uh, make this uh, book in 2018, uh, we were thinking a lot about uh, from where to start. And it was a complicated, complicated question. We initially wanted to focus only on the contemporary art uh, of the uh, post-Soviet period uh, after uh, Ukraine got its independence. But then gradually we realized that the wider context is probably not so well known for the international audience and also make it make sense to, to show the roots of the contemporary development of artistic practices in Ukraine. So that's how we basically came to this, uh, this wider, wider lens. And that's why, how we started our project. Unfortunately, when we, uh, or fortunately, I don't even know how to interpret this data because we uh, presented our book, uh, I think, in early early March uh, 2020, just like uh, I think a week or two before the lockdown started. So basically our book uh, got very little exposure at the time when it was presented because all the humankind was basically focused on other things. So we were a little bit heartbroken for a while and now, surprisingly or sadly, due to the circumstances of the ongoing war uh, in Ukraine, uh, we realized that it was a uh, uh, in a way, a happy coincidence that we managed to publish this book uh, beforehand, because now at least there is some way for the international audience, because the book was also published in English, uh, to have at least some idea about the uh, development of contemporary art uh, practices in Ukraine. And I'm very proud to start this project from France. I'm very proud that my first publishers were French uh, publishing house. And I really want to thank Igor for all he does for the promotion of Ukrainian art today. So returning to our main hero from which we are starting, Ilya Repin. Uh, we decided to start uh, this uh, discussion from uh, this uh, figure. Uh, first of all, because there was a big exhibition of uh, Ilya Repin in uh, Paris uh, recently, and also because it's uh, really uh, indeed one of the most important figures for the development of Ukrainian art of the 20th and probably even early 21st century, in spite of the fact that it's a highly ambiguous uh, figure. It's a hybrid figure, the same as like, for instance, uh, Mykola Gogol, uh, or uh, even to a certain extent, Taras Shevchenko, who uh, were uh, working in the conditions of uh, Russian Empire and sometimes some of their works were uh, made uh, in uh, uh, Russian language but uh, in spite of all that a lot of those uh, overs, they are dedicated to Ukrainian topics and uh, Ilya Repin was born uh, in Ukraine and uh, of course he is one of the major representatives of Russian Imperial School of Painting but uh, throughout his uh, life Life, he dedicated a lot of artworks and a lot of uh, uh, memoirs to Ukraine. So uh, today we are speaking about him in the context of the uh, development of Ukrainian historical painting. And uh, of course, uh, this uh, this iconic painting uh, uh, of uh, Zaporozhye Kazakhs writing the letter to a uh, Turkish Sultan was a cult uh, artwork, not only uh, in the early 20th century, but in the Soviet Union and uh, afterwards, it still uh, has its relevance and it still influences the collective Im imaginary of Ukrainian people about how uh, Ukrainian uh, historical figures looked like back in the 17th, 18th century. And uh, the reason uh, why this uh, artwork became so um, well known uh, was partially due to the fact that 
Ilya Repin was one of the key figures uh, that were uh, established as like so-called forefathers of socialist realism when it was born in 1930s in the USSR. Uh, in spite of the fact that Repin himself was not supporting the uh, Soviet Union and uh, was uh, uh, spent uh, the second half and uh, the last year of his life uh, in uh, Finland in his house and uh, in spite of the fact that uh, the highest uh, bureaucrats of the Soviet Union were doing their best to bring him back to uh, the Soviet uh, to the USSR he uh, never accepted that invitation but uh, in spite of this fact uh, his uh, style of realistic even sometimes hyper realistic painting uh, influenced a lot the establishment of a uh, Soviet socialist realism in the Soviet Union in general. And in Ukraine, of course, uh, the major painting of Repin on the Ukrainian topic became this uh, uh, um, foundation stone on which uh, the Ukrainian school of historical painting of the uh, mid 20th century was uh, being built. And uh, the echo of this painting we see in many artworks throughout uh, the history of Ukrainian art of the Soviet period. We even uh, made uh, together with Igor um, an article, I mean, I wrote it, but for the book that uh, Igor was editing, an article about the legacy of Repin uh, for the 20th and 21st century art in Ukraine. And we found a lot of interesting um, resemblances and interesting parallels up till nowadays. And now we will show you a couple of artworks from the 20th century that also uh, Con connect uh, Ilya Repin to, 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 to uh, more contemporary epochs. For instance, this is the painting of Mihailo de Regus, uh, a classic uh, of socialist realism of the uh, middle of the 20th century. And of course, uh, this uh, painting bears a lot of resemblance with uh, uh, works of Ilya Repin, especially with one of the, another version of uh, the famous painting about the Porozhye Cossacks, which uh, is uh, uh, now in the collection of Kharkiv Museum of Art. It has a, a lot in common with this uh, uh, work by Mihailo de Regos. And of course, both of them refer to famous, uh, famous uh, text by Makolo Gogol, uh, which is uh, called Taras Bulba. Another, uh, another uh, important uh, echo of uh, Repin's work in the um, 21st already uh, century was a movie made by uh, by a famous uh, Ukrainian filmmaker Yuri Ilyenko in 2001 and uh, the uh, art director of this uh, movie was uh, um, artist who uh, came from a long line of uh, artists in Soviet Union and uh, who um, brought this uh, aesthetics of uh, Cossacks and in the rapping uh, understanding maybe to a certain extent of this word to the aesthetics of this uh, first Ukrainian first blockbuster in the history of independent Ukraine was which was uh, called uh, the prayer for Hetman Mazepa. Hetman Ivan Mazepa is a historical figure uh, also a very controversial figure which is uh, considered to be a hero for uh, Ukrainian uh, history and a traitor uh, according to the Russian official historical narrative, but this movie marked an uh, important, uh, uh, how to say it, uh, important point in the history of development of uh, Ukrainian new cinematography. It was uh, very grotesque and uh, very rooted in this uh, Soviet aesthetics of uh, presentation of uh, uh, Cossacks, of Ukrainian past and Ukrainian history. And even up till now, uh, we hear the echo of uh, this uh, rapping uh, style of uh, portrayal of uh, the Porozhye Cossacks in, uh, for instance, uh, first uh, uh, graphic novel uh, of in, made in the independent Ukraine about uh, the uh, Cossacks and their life uh, and uh, some adventures by Maxim Prosolov, uh, writer and uh, uh, author of this idea. And, uh, uh, painter and artist Alexei Chibikin. And uh, the 
if we see this, uh, the aesthetic of this graphic novel, we see a lot of resembles with the same canon of depiction of uh, the uh, Cossacks. And why did it happen? Because Oleksiy Chibikin was brought uh, in the Soviet art school. He's a graduate of uh, Kiev Academy of Fine Arts, which is a former Kiev Art Institute, where the same, uh, the same classics of uh, socialist realism uh, used to teach. Milo Diragus, uh, Milko, and other other artists who were who were uh, basically continuing this uh, canonical. Uh, um, how to say it, visualization of the Parogia Cossacks uh, based on the uh, example of uh, Repin's, uh, Repin's artwork. And uh, the most interesting part of this whole uh, story with Repin, for which is a long story, but we are just trying to, to uh, put it in short uh, and uh, uh, describe it briefly, is that the long echo of this artwork we see not only in uh, the art itself, but also in the uh, fabric of reality of contemporary Ukrainian society and uh, in the aesthetic of mass protests and revolutions which uh, happened in Ukraine in the course of the last several decades. For instance, uh, the mass protests of 2013 and 14, which uh, have uh, different names, some uh, scholars uh, call them Euromaidan, some call them the Revolution of Dignity. So these protests uh, included a lot of people who were who were uh, dressing themselves in the uh, folk uh, costumes uh, in the costumes of ukrainian cossacks and uh, sometimes even directly quoting the aesthetics of uh, Repin's artwork. It is showing you the extent to which this aesthetic uh, went uh, deep into the society. It's now perceived as a, as a, as a, as a given fact that the uh, Zaporozhye Cossacks looks exactly as Ilya Repin portrayed them in his famous artwork. But the interesting fact is that uh, Ilya Repin, uh, when he was uh, making this artwork, he uh, portrayed uh, his friends from the uh, intellectual elite of the 19th century. So it's basically, it, this artwork has a lot of from masquerade. These are people who are theatrically dressed to look like Cossacks. And this contradiction and this gap between this uh, reality of uh, a Cossack uh, movement and this uh, theatrical representation somehow uh, makes this uh, artwork incredibly appealing for many generations of Ukrainians who sometimes bear absolutely different political uh, positions. Thank you, Alisa. So that's one aspect uh, we wanted to develop. Now, um, the, the second point, well, there's very uh, interesting uh, masterpieces. Il uh, y a beaucoup de, de, de morceaux intéressants pour, de, dans l'art nouveau ukrainien aussi. Euh, mais on, on, on laisse ça un peu de, de, de côté, justement, pour, pour se concentrer sur, sur, sur d'autres de, sur de, points. Donc là, on avait décidé de, de dire deux mots de l'avant-garde. Alors l'avant-garde, c'est effectivement un mouvement cosmopolite qui se revendique international, mais il y a malgré tout une spécificité ukrainienne. Il y a certains artistes avant-gardistes ukrainiens qui ont une tonalité particulière. Ici, on va vous montrer, vous en montrer deux. Le premier, c'est Alexandro Bogomazov, donc avec deux tableaux qu'il a écrit à la, fin de, à la fin de sa vie, qu'il a peint à la fin des, des années 20. Voilà, aiguisage, aiguisage des scies et euh, roulage des trompes. So, can you say a few words, Alisa, please, about uh, Bogomazov? Yes, now we are uh, moving uh, forward and we are speaking about uh, an absolutely different epoch. Ukrainian, uh, the development of Ukrainian uh, modernism and Ukrainian avant-garde. Uh, and uh, it's one of the most important uh, stages in the development of Uk Ukrainian art. And uh, art of the early 20th century in Ukraine was blooming. And uh, Alexander Bogomazov is one of the key representatives of uh, Ukrainian uh, 
modernism and avant-garde. He studied in, in 1912 together with David Burduk and Vladimir Mayakovsky in Moscow uh, School of Painting, but and uh, uh, started his career as Cuba futurist, participating in a lot of exhibitions. Uh, some of them were, uh, for instance, organized by such uh, um, a prominent figure, another prominent figure of uh, Ukrainian uh, modernism and avant-garde, Alexandra Exter. And um, gradually, he moved in his uh, artistic practice to something completely different from, from this classical uh, Cubo-Futurist uh, painting. He, he moved to his own understanding of uh, space and light and uh, his, um, his, uh, uh, his uh, uh, own uh, invention was this artistic direction, which we, he called spectralism, uh, in which he paid a lot of attention to light and uh, to uh, in this um, musical uh, beauty of uh, the light, sometimes applied to the very mundane topics. Uh, for instance, uh, such a, uh, is his uh, series of the late 1920s, uh, where he focused on the depiction of labor. So people at work, typical, typical topic of Soviet, uh, uh, Soviet art of this uh, era. But at the same time, in the artworks of uh, uh, this series, uh, uh, only a part of this series uh, Bogomazov uh, managed to uh, fulfill. Uh, and uh, this part was uh, dedicated to uh, sewing the timber. Uh, so we see this uh, uh, people, for instance, on this uh, small sketch uh, to uh, the artwork, which was never finished, uh, that are rolling timber. So. Uh, Normally, in Soviet art, such uh, such uh, such uh, topics would be depicted in a completely different way, as we remember from the history of later Soviet art. But here, Bogomazov combines these topics that uh, were emerging in response to this uh, new Soviet ideology, and at the same time, his uh, his uh, background as an avant-garde uh, painter, and he creates this absolutely musical composition of uh, depicting people at work it's such a such a such an unexpected uh, combination that it gives a feeling of some sac sacred uh, sacred ritual happening instead of like just uh, some mundane everyday activity on va vous parler donc aussi d'un second représentant de l'avant-garde donc Bogomazov il était de Kiev euh, il y a un aspect de l'avant-garde lié au design ça c'est l'œuvre de une œuvre de Vassili euh, Yermilov donc il lui était à Kharkiv on vous en vous parlera après de l'école de Kharkiv et de la spécificité de cette ville can you say something about these uh, uh, designer please uh, yeah, Alisa uh, especially book designer yeah. Yes, uh, Alexander Bogomazov, yes, it's, uh, this chapter is uh, about uh, Kiev and Vasily Yermilov uh, is another important figure of uh, Ukrainian modernism who uh, lived and worked in Kharkiv. It is important to remember that Kharkiv was the first capital of Soviet Ukraine. It was the capital of Soviet Ukraine from 1919 uh, till 1935 uh, uh, for 15 years. And the reason why it happened was because Kiev uh, was um, the center of the um, more, um, how to say it, um, independence focused uh, national movements. Uh, and uh, when Soviet Union was established, uh, Soviet, um, um, how to say it, uh, leaders chose a more neutral Kharkiv uh, to represent the capital. And it just was, a, in a way, even a symbolic punishment, punishment to Kiev, uh, which uh, was uh, fighting for the independent Ukraine. But for Kharkiv, it was a great time because uh, the art was blooming there in the 1920s. And Vasily Yermilov one of this, is one of those key figures that worked and uh, lived in that uh, period. He uh, aligned himself with the, the Ukrainian constructivism. And uh, this uh, image, for instance, which you see here, is the um, sketch for the cover of a famous uh, constructivist uh, magazine which was called uh, Avant-Garde and edited by a famous writer Valerian Palishuk. This, uh, um, this uh, 
constructivist uh, uh, media didn't live for long. It existed only for a couple of years and was destroyed and uh, closed by the uh, Soviet officials due to its, uh, like, uh, its um, freedom and uh, its uh, artistic uh, experiments that uh, happened uh, in uh, the circle that was aligning uh, with this uh, magazine. And uh, the last uh, work of the uh, avant-garde, this uh, uh, which, has to do, which has to do with Ukrainian language. Can you say a few words about yeah. uh, what happened to Ukrainian language at the beginning of the 20th century with the revolution and after in the 30s, please? Yes, uh, book design in general was extremely important for uh, Kharkiv uh, uh, school of 1920s. And Vasily Yermilov uh, is famous for his type of... Uh, 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 faces and uh, this uh, artwork is uh, uh, was made by Alexander Vlisko uh, by for the um, book of poetry of his uh, um, brother Alexa Vlisko and uh, it's uh, one of another uh, of the examples of uh, Kharkiv design of 19. Uh, 20s and early 1930s and uh, um, the book uh, is in Ukrainian uh, language it's called I live I work and uh, it shows the importance of uh, Ukrainian language in uh, uh, in uh, the life of Soviet Ukraine of 1920s because uh, back then uh, the attitude of Soviet ideologists towards uh, language issue was not still not so strict and uh, to certain extent uh, this national uh, national peculiarities were even uh, supported and promoted so a lot of uh, ukrainian artists and writers at that uh, stage had uh, freedom to uh, to work in their native uh, tongue and uh, this gave birth to a huge uh, a huge movement in ukrainian art which is sometimes called the red renaissance and sometimes it's called uh, the um, the executed renaissance uh, because uh, because most of those artists and writers who participated in this uh, revival of arts in the early Soviet uh, epoch were later uh, killed or sent to concentration camps uh, uh, in uh, late 1930s during Stalin's uh, great uh, terror so this uh, this whole freedom of expression and the abruptly ended in 1937 but in Ukraine it ended even earlier because Ukraine was the um, place where this uh, huge famine of 1932 and 33 took place and uh, where millions of people peasants were died uh, because of this organized effort of the Soviet state in order to punish uh, Ukrainian people uh, for not wanting to go to the collective farms and this was one of the biggest tragedies of Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian history of 1930s, and uh, that was when Ukraine a lot of Ukrainian uh, artistic uh, leaders of artistic uh, field realized that uh, Soviet regime wasn't such a such a such a positive and good uh, thing. A lot of them committed suicides. A, lo a lot of persecution started back, back then after this uh, great famine. So this great terror in Ukraine started much earlier than in the rest of the Soviet Union. And uh, last work, it's a, a Malevich work from the, the 30s. Um, it's not only uh, something formal, it has to do with the Ukrainian history of the of this period. Can you say something about it, please, Alisa? Uh, yes, it's very important. Like uh, Malevich is one of those uh, main contested figures in the history of Ukrainian art because uh, he belongs at the same time to many contexts. He is an inter representative of international avant-garde. Uh, he is uh, he he was born in Kiev uh, and he spent uh, his youth. Uh, in uh, uh, Ukraine and he left a lot of uh, memoirs where he mentions Ukraine when he speaks about his Ukrainian childhood and uh, at the same time he belonged to the Russian uh, context so it's 
obviously a contested figure, but in many autobiographies, in uh, famous autobiography, uh, one of them, he mentioned uh, that he was a Ukrainian and uh, he created this uh, peasant, uh, second peasant ci cycle. Uh, and um, when he was uh, teaching at the uh, Institute of uh, Art in uh, Kiev, so a lot of uh, scholars, such as Dmitry Horbachev, uh, for instance, they stress the importance of you, this experience of uh, visiting Ukraine again in his adult years for the creation of this second pe pe peasant uh, cycle. And uh, a lot of uh, scholars and researchers even connect the statics of this uh, second pe peasant cycle with uh, with the ongoing collectivization in uh, Ukraine and this uh, for feeling of this great famine. Uh, thank you. Now a few words about the, the third thing we, were, we would like to develop. It is, um, il s'agit de, de l'art populaire ukrainien, qui est vraiment une spécificité, euh, une spécificité de, de ce pays, qui a euh, en réalité trois aspects. Il y a un rapport complexe à l'idéologie euh, soviétique, puisque en tant qu'art populaire, c'est un art qui est évidemment euh, favorisé, mais en même temps, c'est un véritable lieu de refuge avec des motifs à part qui, euh, qui n'ont rien à voir avec euh, les motifs euh, de la politique officielle. Euh, le deuxième aspect dont, dont nous parlera euh, Alissa, c'est que cet art est principalement fait par des, par des femmes. C'est un art euh, euh, réalisé par des artistes femmes, alors que euh, le grand art, euh, l'art académique euh, soviétique, était une, une affaire essentiellement, euh, essentiellement masculine. Et la troisième chose qui est intéressante, c'est qu'il y a eu très tôt, euh, dans les années 20, des ateliers... Euh, ce n'était pas un art académique effectivement, mais il y a eu des ateliers où il y a eu des échanges entre des artistes avant-gardistes et euh, des artistes euh, issus euh, de, de, de l'art populaire, ce qui donne à, à ces œuvres une qualité euh, tout à fait particulière. So maybe in, in general, a few words about this folk art, uh, Alisa, please. Yes, uh, folk art uh, is a very interesting chapter uh, in the development of Ukrainian artistic practices of the 20th century. And again, as uh, many, many phenomena uh, of this uh, era, a very ambiguous one, uh, because uh, the roots of uh, Ukrainian folk uh, renaissance uh, in the uh, Soviet uh, era uh, go back to the avant-garde times when uh, Ukrainian artists, uh, avant-gardists, Alexandra Exter, Evgenia Pribilska, together with uh, Malevich, experimented uh, with uh, applied uh, uh, arts and uh, were uh, making designs for purses, uh, small pillows, and uh, those designs were executed by uh, um, small workshops in uh, Ukrainian villages. And for many uh, folk artists, uh, being part of uh, that, those workshops became like this, you know, ticket to the new life because uh, they learned uh, how to combine their uh, traditional Ukrainian folk style with, uh, with uh, the uh, modern elements of modernism. And of course, for uh, Ukrainian avant-gardists, it was very important to collaborate with uh, folk artists. And again, a lot of scholars stress the important of, uh, importance of uh, this uh, aesthetics of uh, folk art in the development of Ukrainian and to a certain extent Russian modernism, because uh, um, where uh, French, for instance, modernists were looking for inspiration in some uh, African uh, uh, folk art that was uh, um, discovered at the beginning of the 20th century by the wider circles of uh, uh, connoisseurs of art. There, uh, for instance, people in who were had connections in, with Ukrainian uh, uh, society or people in the Russian Empire, they were looking for their own roots of inspiration and their own ways how to how to diversify their artistic practice. And a lot of that inspiration they would find in uh, the 
folk art. So folk art is very in, entangled with uh, the development of Ukrainian modernism in general. And uh, in the 1930s, when this great famine started, uh, and when the repressions against uh, against uh, central figures of Ukrainian uh, modernism started, the Soviet ideologists, the leaders of the Soviet uh, uh, state started looking for some other alternative alternative uh, uh, you know uh, uh, figures and alternative uh, artists so for them uh, folk art became this very uh, very convenient uh, convenient topic because first of all, uh, after the Great Famine, after those millions of deaths of uh, Ukrainian peasants, it was very important to illustrate uh, the famous Stalinist slogan that uh, life became better, life became happier. Of course, it became happier and all the, you know, uh, peasants in Ukrainian kolkhoz farms f feel so great that they even have time and la to leisure to, uh, to, to, to paint and to create artworks so it was a very convenient uh, convenient uh, narrative for the soviet propaganda at the same time uh, soviet uh, uh, state was uh, executed the uh, famous modernists from the boychukist circle who were focusing also on uh, ukrainian uh, folklore topics and uh, ukrainian ukrainian uh, topics in general but at the same time so again uh, this folk art became this very easy and uh, great substitute for those uh, artists who were uh, executed during the great purge but so for uh, development of those folk artists uh, there were uh, a lot of efforts made to 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 create uh, uh, to educate uh, this uh, artist so for instance there were like this special workshops in uh, kiev where uh, prominent art artists uh, and representatives of ukrainian modernism such as uh, anatoly petritsky vasil krichevsky and other were working together with folk artists who were embroidering who were making some small figures from bread in order to bring some new inspiration to this uh, field of folk art. And that's from where, uh, for instance, the famous Ukrainian artist Maria Primachenko uh, comes from. She is uh, known uh, in uh, Ukraine uh, widely and loved a lot. Uh, and uh, she's perceived mainly as this author of uh, uh, folk uh, folk art and this grandmother uh, who lived in the village and never uh, came out of this village and was just inspired you know by cosmos and uh, nothing else which is not uh, actually true because in 1935 and 36 uh, maria primachenko was a student at that uh, workshops in kiev uh, which were led by uh, the famous ukrainian modernists uh, vasily krichevsky anatoly petritsky and others so in a way she was also a hybrid figure uh, combining both uh, folk elements and elements of ukrainian modernism in her practice so here are her famous uh, creatures, her famous beasts, uh, which became uh, one of the symbols of Ukraine and Ukrainian art. And sadly, uh, you Museum of Maria Primachenko in uh, a small village of Ivankiv was among the first uh, cultural art, uh, monuments and cultural centers that were uh, destroyed by uh, Russian airstrikes in uh, February, I think, 26 or 28 uh, of uh, this year. But a lot of uh, the artworks were saved by local people, by enthusiasts. And uh, today, Maria Primachenko is uh, again, you know, uh, again in the center of attention due to the sad circumstances uh, which on retrouvera euh, Maria Primachenko tout à l'heure dans une œuvre euh, contemporaine donc qui fait allusion à ces animaux là euh, là on va passer à un univers totalement euh, différent à l'école de, de Kharkiv hein, donc c'est vraiment ça qui est intéressant euh, dans, dans l'art ukrainien c'est la diversité euh, euh, non seulement lié à une histoire euh, tourmentée, une histoire pleine de ruptures, mais aussi la diversité euh, géographique. 
Donc, euh, l'école de Kharkiv, eh bien, elle, elle, elle se déroule, euh, elle, elle a sa place dans cette ville euh, qui est une ville euh, industrielle, une, une grande ville euh, de l'époque euh, soviétique. Alissa en a dit quelques mots tout à l'heure. Kharkiv a été la capitale jusqu'en euh, 1934. Euh, c'est aussi le lieu où, où, où euh, c'est un grand lieu d'architecture euh, constructiviste. Et ça, c'est l'un des premiers euh, gratte-ciel euh, soviétiques, euh, le Gosprom, le, le bâtiment de la un bâtiment administratif de, de, de l'industrie d'État. Uh, can you say a few words about this uh, Gosprom building, please, Alisa? Yes, uh, uh, thank you. Yeah, we already mentioned uh, Kharkiv uh, today, and uh, of course, if we speak about uh, Ukrainian art of the 20th century, Kharkiv would be one of the one of the key key areas where uh, artistic practice is developed. And uh, back uh, in 1925-28, uh, when Kharkiv uh, still uh, was the capital of uh, the first capital of the Soviet Ukraine, uh, this magnificent uh, and uh, building, which is a legend today, the Gosprom, uh, was constructed by uh, Russian um, architects, uh, Sergei uh, uh, Ifino, Samuel, Samuel Kranz and uh, Mark uh, Fegler. So uh, this uh, building uh, was in a way a uh, present from the central government to the Soviet Ukraine. And it was, uh, it, it became the symbol of uh, Soviet Kharkiv. It's a, it's a giant building. Here we see a photograph uh, that was made in 1953. And uh, up till today, uh, this building remains one of the symbol of constructivism in Kharkiv and uh, one of the symbols of Kharkiv in general and this is like uh, this uh, very important important uh, uh, example of uh, constructivism which uh, um, was uh, one of the main uh, styles of uh, Soviet Kharkiv. Kharkiv is a city where there is a lot of uh, constructivist architecture. Alors, on va vous montrer euh, trois photos de, de, de Boris Mikhailov, donc, qui est l'auteur le, le, le plus connu euh, de l'école de Kharkiv. Cette école, elle a un double aspect, un aspect euh, technique. C'est une école qui, a, qui à la base, est faite euh, par des, des, des amateurs, mais des ingénieurs. Donc, il y a beaucoup de, de montage. Et elle a aussi un aspect idéologique, ou plutôt euh, anti-idéologique. Hein, L'idée, c'était de montrer euh, la vie soviétique euh, sous un autre jour, et aussi de montrer des choses que l'on ne montrait pas euh, dans ce quotidien euh, soviétique. Donc ici, on, euh, on va vous montrer euh, trois photos euh, de Boris Mikhailov. Could you, could you comment these three photographies, please, uh, Alice? Yes, uh, uh, Harvey School of Photography uh, today uh, receives a lot of attention, and uh, French scholar Nadia Bernard Kovalchuk is uh, ex examining and studying this uh, topic in uh, great detail. And I know that she is also uh, having her presentation, so I. I'm sure that she will uh, tell more about this uh, this uh, topic. But uh, what I want to, to mention is that yes, uh, Kharkiv School of uh, Photography is one of the uh, most important phenomena in the history of Ukrainian art of the late 20th century. And surprisingly, uh, it appeared not on the artistic ground. It uh, it the roots of this movement are in the amateur uh, Soviet photography. Photography was one of the main uh, hobbies of Soviet people. There were factories where cameras were produced and there were a lot of some amateur uh, this, um, uh, groups of people who would uh, come together and discuss all the nuances of uh, photography. And from one of those uh, circles in Kharkiv, uh, this uh, powerful new school of photography emerged. And uh, it emerged as a, a group of people who started uh, looking critically at photography and started using it as a conceptual tool of uh, um, maybe even um, undermining the main messages of the official uh, Soviet uh, propaganda and photography. Because uh, Soviet uh, photography in general was very optimistic. It was focusing on positive uh, sides of Soviet life. Life is great, life is amazing, Soviet Union is developing very fast and it's like all is mind-blowingly uh, great. And uh, Kharkiv artists uh, from the circle of the group time, as they uh, called themselves, which was established in 1971. Uh, on the contrary, 
focused on some maybe not such appealing sides of Soviet reality. They focused on some things that maybe were not um, uh, allowed uh, in the official photography. And this, uh, their critical method, which they called the theory of the blow, uh, became uh, their characteristic feature. One of the most important and uh, today well-known representatives of this school of photography is Boris Mikhailov. He started uh, in 1960s as a regular common Soviet engineer. He didn't have any artistic training, but but uh, due to his interest in uh, the photography as a critical tool and conceptual tool, he was one of the mo first uh, photographers in the history of Ukrainian art who uh, gave this critical gaze and critical uh, optics of uh, Soviet reality. And this. Uh, mm, this uh, series, which uh, uh, Igor is showing now, is called Yesterday's Sandwich, and uh, it 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 uh, was uh, it was born almost uh, uh, by chance when uh, Boris Mikhailov was combining two images and the third uh, reality started emerging. And he suddenly understood that this combination of two uh, images sometimes can give this absurdist, slightly surreal, but very interesting and sharp, uh, becomes the sharp commentary to the social reality. So for instance, this photograph, we see this ear that is suddenly poking on the background of a regular uh, scene from Soviet life. And we all remember that Soviet um, uh, secret services were uh, so um, so powerful in the in the in the 1970s uh, that uh, they were almost everywhere, like uh, even in the artistic circles, there would always be somebody who would be appointed from the KGB to look uh, and to, to see what was happening in uh, those narrow circles of of, uh, artists. So there was always this ever per, uh, present ear listening to what you were saying. So in a way, it's a, it's a sharp and nice commentary to the Soviet life. And another series of Boris Mikhailov, this one, uh, which is called Red, it's one of his most emblematic and most well-known series. It was shot in uh, Kharkiv in late 60s and 70s. And uh, it shows us how, pers how um, uh, abusive even this uh, red color of Soviet propaganda uh, became in uh, the Soviet Union. It was basically everywhere. It was on ev in every corner of Soviet life. Everything was colored in this very bright and active uh, color. But at the same time, it was so, uh, so spread in the fabric of reality that to a certain extent people stopped even noticing it. And that's what happened not only with the red color, but with the slogans of the Soviet propaganda that were everywhere. But at the same time, by the end of uh, 60s and 70s, and especially in the 80s, they stopped like being even relevant to Soviet people because they were like this white noise uh, that was everywhere, but people were just not, not, not even uh, focusing on it. So this is a very nice uh, commentary to the condition of a uh, late uh, post-Soviet uh, time. So maybe we're going to, to, to on va peut-être passer à la deuxième partie de, de notre exposé, hein, les, pour qu'on ait un peu de temps si, si vous avez des questions, hein, so people have time for, for questions. So we're going to go to the second part of our of your, your speech. Donc uh, Alissa va, va, va commenter uh, six photos Hein, de, enfin, six, six œuvres qui ont été réalisées euh, durant euh, justement les, les derniers, euh, ces, derniers, ces derniers jours, ces dernières semaines, en mars, euh, février, euh, mars 2022, au moment où la guerre a commencé. Euh, donc voilà d'abord euh, Katrina Lisovenko, donc cette œuvre qui est devenue une, une icône euh, sur les réseaux sociaux. Can you say a few words about this, this work, Alisa, please? Yes, uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to speak uh, more about the history of Ukrainian art and especially its development in the times of independence. But uh, all that uh, information is in the book, of course. And I hope uh, that, yes, uh, that if uh, you have interest, you can you can uh, explore it deeper. And now we are moving, yes, to the said uh, 
part of our uh, of our conversation because it's dedicated to the ongoing uh, invasion of Russia which started into Ukraine which started on February 24th and uh, which is still uh, uh, unfortunately a thing and which is still threatening uh, thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of lives in Ukraine and we don't know uh, still the outcome of this uh, situation uh, but uh, immediately after the war started I started uh, collecting the artworks that were created uh, during this uh, period. Uh, in general, as a curator and as an art historian, I'm uh, tremendously interested in the um, in the uh, times of turbulence and uh, times of uh, social change and how they influence uh, Ukrainian art. Because uh, when we uh, see uh, those um, changes of epochs, for instance, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Orange Revolution of 2004, the Revolution of 2014. We immediately see that they, first of all, uh, bring a lot of uh, inspiration to the artists. And they sometimes even bring uh, new, uh, new generations of artists on the scene. So, of course, uh, there was nothing like this in terms of scale and uh, um, drama in the recent history of Ukraine. Uh, so I, I started following this, uh, this development of artistic practices immediately. And uh, I noticed uh, several interesting things. First of all, uh, for instance, uh, if we take the revolution of 2013 and 14, it was also very focused on imagery. The social networks were already there, but uh, the most relevant uh, medium at that time was photography. People, artists would take uh, cameras and go to the streets of Kiev, take uh, pictures of protesters, take pictures of the barricades, post them online, exchange exchange them and it was like it was everywhere it was like this uh, all prevailing uh, imagery of uh, the protests uh, surprisingly enough uh, when the war started uh, the main uh, medium uh, is uh, the drawing there are different like ways how we can interpret the situation. For instance, we were talking to uh, Igor, with Igor that it might be due to the fact that today we don't have enough trust to the photography anymore. We perceive it as a, as a, as post-truth. And uh, this way, and maybe the depths of the trauma of war is not even still, uh, we are still not able to express it with uh, the means of photography. Probably the most relevant photographic image of this war, which is not included in this uh, presentation, uh, is a series which is, uh, which is posted uh, to Facebook by one of the editors-in-chief uh, of uh, leading Ukrainian art magazines. Um, the magazine's uh, title is Antiquar, and uh, the uh, editor in chief is called Anna Sherman. Every morning in her apartment, she takes a picture of her, not of herself, of her feet uh, when she's sitting and drinking coffee in her apartment in Kiev. And this is one of the most expressive and mind blowing images because I see them every day. And I see that she's still there, she's still alive, she's still drinking coffee, and she's still in Kyiv and this is an incredibly expressive series which is like which is still uh, uh, continuing I, I, I hope that uh, the last uh, photograph of that series would be the picture of Anna Sherman sitting in peaceful uh, Kyiv after the end of this uh, war and invasion so uh, among the drawings of the uh, first day of the days of the war one of the most viral images was this uh, drawing by a female artist Katerina Lisovenko uh, who uh, expressed her like anger like uh, usually we see uh, Ukraine like we see um, women uh, as uh, like this uh, passive uh, um, uh, receiving maybe uh, 
images of uh, of uh, um, how to say it maybe if even if it comes to the uh, war topics they are like uh, victims they are victimized they are not uh, they are just like uh, perceived as as as, as uh, how to say it uh, witnesses or witnesses or victims of this situation so Katerina Lisevenka completely changes the focus she she shows this uh, Madonna with her uh, child who are like just showing this brutal fact to the invaders and this is basically the mood of ukrainian protest and the mood of why it express it says a lot about how people feel uh, about this uh, invasion and it shows the energy uh, which uh, sometimes even surprises the international audience when people see how uh, how determined ukrainians are to fight uh, russians and not to allow them to conquer their country this is then a drawing made by Boris Kashapov, an artist who managed to flee Ukraine on the first day after invasion with his wife and his small child. And he even inspired me for the title of my one of my articles about uh, about uh, this uh, uh, war and the art of war, because uh, uh, when they were telling me about how they were escaping Kiev uh, after the bombing started, uh, they told me that they were absolutely not ready as they are an artistic family uh, he's an artist his wife is a curator and they started assembling their suitcase and they somehow managed to uh, put their very absurdist uh, set of items a children's a child's party dress a roll of toilet paper a candle and a hammer for some reason and this shows us like this vulnerability of a creative person in the face of such brutal aggression and war when uh, you don't know how to react so uh, Boris was lucky because uh, he and his family managed to flee on the first day after the invasion and they are now in Bucharest uh, a lot of uh, artists uh, in Europe are now supporting Ukrainian artists there are like numerous initiatives and uh, thousands of people in Europe who are helping Ukrainian refugees and Ukrainian artists in particular. So this drawing was already made by Boris Kashapar when he was in Bucharest in rel relative safety, but it still is called the fear that is covering my face and it expresses this anxiety that, uh, uh, and trauma of the war. And uh, this is one of my favorite uh, drawings of this period. Uh, and it was created on uh, February 28th uh, after the destruction of the Museum of Maria Primachenko, which I already mentioned uh, earlier. And uh, Danila Movchan is an artist uh, from Lviv. Uh, and he, in his uh, normal uh, life, uh, he's working a lot with contemporary icon paintings or there is usually a lot of Christian symbolism in his drawings and he's uh, working on almost every day creating a series dedicated to this war every day he writes he makes one two sometimes even more drawings which uh, which uh, are dedicated to this or that event of this war Lviv is still relatively peaceful so he has this ability to focus on uh, art and uh, this uh, drawing shows us a typical uh, beast typical creature from uh, Maria Primachenko's uh, uh, works from the works of this artist whose museum was destroyed in Ivankiv and this beast is colored in the colors of Ukrainian flag uh, yellow yellow and blue and it's attacking this mystical black un, uh, unknown creature which uh, in the collective imaginary of uh, Ukrainian people symbolizes uh, uh, Russia. This the is Red another this is uh, this is another uh, work uh, uh, which was made uh, like on the 1st of March uh, uh, in Kiev by one of the most uh, prominent representatives of uh, Ukrainian contemporary art uh, painter and photographer Arsen Svadov. Uh, it's uh, basically not a staged series, it's just a photo documentation of uh, Arsen's walks around the city, which is all uh, uh, now consists mostly of checkpoints. 
checkpoints are on every or every corner. But Arsen Savadov is uh, uh, so dedicated to Kiev, and he loves Kiev so much that he decided to stay in Kiev and not to flee anywhere. And he walks around and he notices things that sometimes people, other people, don't notice. For instance, uh, these uh, pictures are the, the, these are the windows of the abandoned Soviet hotel, which was called uh, the Red Star. And uh, someone uh, a few years ago uh, had probably some art project uh, when they uh, covered the windows of uh, this Red Star Hotel with old uh, photographs from the early 20th century. After that, the local authorities decided to uh, provide some ventilation uh, to this building and cut those holes in these uh, old photographs. And in a way, this became a powerful statement about the black holes of memory that are still tormenting us, memory about the 20th century. And uh, as we know, like uh, one of the main slogans and one of the, uh, the ideology of Putin when he's invading uh, Ukraine is uh, very much based on the stereotypes uh, from the 20th century. He's playing with trauma that uh, Ukrainian and Russian society has from uh, that uh, century and uh, is uh, quite successful in uh, re-weaponizing those, uh, those traumas. This is another very interesting project which uh, was started by Ukrainian female artist uh, Daria Kaltsova back in 2014 when uh, the war in uh, Donbass in the eastern Ukraine started. And uh, what Daria did, she noticed suddenly the beauty and this geom of the geometric patterns which appear on the windows of uh, uh, the apartments which are being covered to prevent the windows from being broken uh, during the air strikes. Today, almost every window in Ukraine is covered with the state everywhere in my mother's apartment in my grandmother's apartment in all my friends apartment everybody is covering the windows now even some artists are trying to be creative and they the the the, the last uh, one i saw the most beautiful uh, uh covering of the window with the tape made by ukrainian artist oksana levchenia she made a spider's web on her on her uh, on her window from this uh, protective tape so daria kaltsova is now continuing her project uh, because she's uh, she's she's taking this uh patterns, these geometric designs of the uh, windows, and she just uh, makes uh, installations uh, dedicated to this, uh, to this, uh, how to say it, uh, unexpected and sudden beauty of this protective tape. Et la dernière œuvre qu'on montrera aujourd'hui, donc elle a affaire avec des, des champignons. Uh, could you explain us the these mushrooms, yes. please, Alisa. This is the, one of my most favorite artworks, uh, which um, was created by a Ukrainian artist, Nikita Kravtsov, who uh, for many years has been living in Paris. And he is incredibly active now after the re Russian invasion. He organizes uh, so many protests and uh, uh, he draws so many uh, placards and uh, posters to support Ukraine. But uh, this, um, this series Nikita started uh, just uh, several months ago, in the end of uh, 2021. Um, he uh, was approached by a Ukrainian publishing house that was celebrating the 100 years uh, anniversary of a uh, famous Ukrainian modernist, Grigory Narbut. Uh, back in uh, 1906, Grigory Narbut uh, created a famous series that uh, was called The War of Mushrooms. It was based on a folk tale, and uh, for, the one, for the anniversary of Narbut, uh, Nikita Nikita Kravtsov decided to make a remake of this series because there was already a, a rumor of the war and uh, he uh, somehow thought that it was a relevant topic for the Ukrainian society nowadays. So the plot of this fairy tale is very simple. A uh, horrible, terrible Tsar of the peace suddenly decides to uh, invade a peaceful uh, 
country of mushrooms. And the leader of mushrooms uh, calls uh, his people for action. A lot of mushrooms just decline. They, 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 they just say, no, I'm too old. I don't want to go to, to war. I'm too young. I don't want to be killed at war. I am, I don't know, not meant for war. I'm not going to fight. Only a couple of mushrooms decide to fight with their leader. And uh, they, uh, in the end of the day, they manage to, uh, to win. And they, they protect their country of mushrooms and everything ends very well. Uh, it's uh, interesting, but uh, Ukrainian uh, translation of this uh, story was supposed to be uh, published like a couple of days uh, after the invasion happened. So we never uh, had any Ukrainian presentation of this book. The reason I know it because I was writing a preface to this book. Uh, but uh, uh, fortunately for Ukrainian art, France uh, usually plays an outstanding role in uh, the development of our artistic practice and especially especially uh, recently. So uh, this book was actually published in French in the end of 2021. And now uh, it's uh, being presented in uh, several uh, art centers and uh, it exists in the French translation. So it's called uh, The War of the Mushrooms. And so in case you are interested in this prophecy, because this, this, this book is in a way a prophecy, uh, I hope uh, to the... Uh, it's, it's a completely a prophecy. About Mahno's gun, about the gun? Yes, uh, this, um, uh, this, uh, par uh, this particular uh, drawing uh, is depicting those uh, mushrooms who finally decided to fight uh, against the uh, evil Tsar of the Peace. And uh, they, were, um, they, were, they grew and they were born on the remains of the, on the, of the pistol of Nestor Mahno. And uh, Nikita Kravtsov used uh, um, the original image of the pistol of Nestor Makhno from one of Ukrainian museums. And Nestor Makhno is the father of Ukrainian anarchism. It's a famous uh, leader of Ukrainian anarchists of this uh, uh, beginning of the 20th century when in the uh, uh, war that uh, happened after the revolution of 1917, uh, this anarchist played a huge role. So in a way, he trying to refer to this heroic story of Ukrainian anarchist movements of uh, 1920s, uh, which uh, precedes the current uh, fighters and current protectors of Ukraine. So thank you very much, Alisa, for all these uh... Uh, explanations about these uh, Ukrainian art pieces and I think it gives a, a very good idea of the complexity and uh, uh, the interesting aspect of these of these art the multiple interesting aspects of these art we have some time for questions on a peu de, de temps pour les questions est-ce que quelqu'un veut, veut poser une question non oui, um, Paquita. Pourquoi Oui. D'accord. OK. So, uh, um, pa Paquita says that uh, Machno is not a positive figure, uh, as an anti-Semitic figure, and it's not a very good idea speaking about Machno, but all the rest is good. You know, a lot of figures in Ukrainian history are controversial. Of course, uh, we can find uh, a lot of uh, problems in every history of every every country. But uh, for Nikita, this uh, anarchists uh, are the symbol of freedom and fighting for liberty. He is not focusing on negative uh, connotations. He is focusing on positive uh, sides and for on this. Uh, even symbolism, it's not about uh, that. In Ukraine, uh, there is not, uh, like, uh, maybe there is not enough discussion about this issue, but mainly uh, Ukrainian anarchists are not associated uh, with uh, anti Semitic uh, movement. Maybe not, but Mahno, yes. Okay. Another question? Another question? <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Do, do you know anything about Boris Mikhailov's fate now? So is he still in the Ukraine? Does he continue his, his work? 
Boris Mikhailov uh, has been living in Germany for many years, so he's in safety. Uh, Kharkiv is in very bad uh, situation, and a lot of uh, artists there are in uh, uh, danger. A lot of them managed to flee, but uh, a lot of them are still uh, there. But Boris Mikhailov is in Berlin, as far as I know. What about this uh, Gosprom building? What is? Uh, do you know something about the the fate of the building? Uh, is something clear or not now? As uh... I don't know uh, anything about Gosprom in particular. I know that around six hundred uh, buildings uh, where people uh, used to live uh, were destroyed uh, in Kharkiv, and even more probably from the time when this I knew this figure. So uh, a lot of these uh, buildings uh, of the constructivist era are damaged, and uh, there uh, is a very like uh, uncertain uh, information from Kharkiv. Some some people recently told me that Gosprom was intact, but I'm not sure about the situation because I don't have any reliable source of information regarding the... I know that the whole center of the city is uh, heavily damaged and partially destroyed. D'autres questions? Paquita? Do you know something about what uh, Ilya Kabakov is doing now? Is he saying something about what's happening or...? Um... I didn't hear uh, anything uh, because Ilya Kabakov is another contested figure. He was born in Dnipro, uh, former Dnipropetrovsk, and, uh, but at the age of 16 he moved to Moscow to study at the art school. So uh, he uh, from time to time wants to reconnect with his uh, first motherland and uh, there were even attempts to um, to, 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 to invite him to participate in the Ukrainian pavilion for uh, Venice Biennale. And uh, I know that he was eager uh, to do it, but recently I haven't heard anything about him, to be honest. Other questions? Anastasia? I'm sorry if, if this question is a little bit off top. It's a question I, want, I really want to know what is your attitude about a uh, project of uh, Ilya Khshanovsky Dao, uh, a film that was uh, uh, done in Kharkiv and that was done actually on uh, money of Russian oligarchs uh, and it's a, like a drug money. I just, I know that uh, Ilya Khshanovsky now. Uh, uh, all of a sudden, he's uh, giving comments as a as a um, person against the war and as a person who who was creating his project in Kharkov. But uh, I don't know. I feel this project was kind of a note to violence, and I just wanted to know your attitude towards it. I think you heard about it, maybe. I Hey, for everybody, uh, uh, just a few words about the content uh, of this project in okay, a few words. It's, uh, it's uh, like it's a film project, uh, it was started uh, by uh, a film director, uh, Ilya Khshanovsky, and uh, initially this, um, the author of, a, um, of the sc screenplay, it was uh, Vladimir Sorokin, but uh, he stopped at certain point to work on this project. And uh, they were filming it, I don't know, during over than 10 years and only uh, a film cut that was done in uh, London uh, took over four years and it's like a series of movies and according to its author it's like a more than a movie, it's like a sort of a huge, uh, huge art project and um, it was... 
Paris at Théâtre de Châtelet. Also. Yeah, it was also presented in Paris at Théâtre de Châtelet, and uh, some parts of that movie were presented uh, at Berlinale, and there was a um, petition against uh, this projection because there are a lot, a lot of eth ethical um, questions because there were participation of uh, the, uh, kids with autism, uh, uh, the, the, there are scenes of rape and violence uh, because it's like a it's like a sort of a <laughs> uh, in a form it was filmed as a form of a reality um, reality show but in historical decorations let's can, say can so, you say so I, I mean I simplify but just so oh, okay. uh, it was it was a uh, so people the participants of that project they were living in a, uh, in a uh, sort of scientific institute uh, that was built in historical de decorations and uh, uh, director and his team uh, were filming uh, their life for many, many years. Uh, I, I'm sorry, maybe it's an off-top, maybe you, you uh, haven't seen this project, I don't know, I just, it, it was in Kharkov and I know that now uh, creators of this project, uh, that, which are really affiliated to Russia, Russian power, they start all of a sudden to present themselves as not victims of the war, but the, the people who are against of the war. And now uh, also Khshanovsky recently became an artistic director of uh, Babin Yar complex. And uh, uh, actually after his arrival, uh, almost all team left uh, the uh, museum management. And uh, I just wanted to know your point of view. Thank you. Uh if you ask me, I never watched uh, this movie and I don't uh, somehow feel like doing it. Not be I don't even know why. I think that artistic transgression is interesting uh, and uh, an artist has uh, freedom to do whatever he wants as long as it doesn't interfere into somebody else's freedom and as long as he's uh, fine with what he's doing. But uh, uh, what uh, is uh, striking for me is the role of Khrzhanovsky in the Bobby Yar project, because that was really a little bit like uh, um, annoying because uh, when uh, I knew very well the team uh, in the Babi Yar uh, that worked on the commemoration of uh, one of the largest uh, tragedies uh, in the Holocaust when hundreds of thousands of people were killed in uh, uh, Kiev uh, in 1941 and uh, there, for many years uh, the team of this uh, future uh, museum was working on uh, how to how to speak about such tragedy what 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 to do and how to formulate it and uh, um, they uh, came up with a lot of interesting ideas and then suddenly uh, the um, leaders and the owners of this uh, complex uh, which somehow appeared to be Russian oligarchs I don't know how it even happened uh, they appointed Khrzhanovsky who uh, started uh, making a kind of uh, Holocaust Disneyland there and uh, there was a lot of criticism of this project and to be honest I also didn't like uh, most of the things that they were doing it I find it grotesque and I find it very inappropriate in the context of this uh, tragedy other than that I have no problem with Khrzhanovsky because I am not so far. I watched his one movie it was called I think four and that was it I know that he uh, he offered uh, a lot of my friends to participate in this project uh, and somehow no, no one agreed from people whom I whom I uh, know but but it was there I, 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 I still think that there should be some historical distance to understand what actually happened there but I am not the one to comment on this a last question from Paquita. So you were asking about the Odessa, what was going on with the, uh, with the artists in Odessa now. Do, do you know something about that? Or? Yes, of course. I'm in touch with many of them. Like, uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, issues with the Odessa Art Museum, uh, which has a very vast collection. And uh, I know that they were working on evacuating their collection. Uh, so. Uh, 
many artists uh, managed to flee from Odessa, but a lot of them remain. So, for instance, uh, Igor Gusev, one of the um, main figures uh, in Odessa art scene, is still there. Yesterday, I spoke with Sergei Anufriev, uh, 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 one of the fathers of Ukrainian conceptualism, and he is still in Odessa. He's uh, working on his uh, projects and uh, promised me to come to Berlin soon. And made a wonderful poem, by the way, how he wants to enjoy sun and how he wants to enjoy spring, uh, other than uh, uh, see this uh, brutal invasion. It's in his Facebook, you can check it out. So thank you very much for being with us, Alisa, and hope to see you soon in Paris and hope this uh, tragedy will soon end. And um, thank you very much for all that. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Merci à vous d'être d'être venu. Donc ce, cette conférence sera enregistrée, on pourra la, la revoir. Et je pense qu'il y aura d'autres événements qui seront organisés par le, en particulier par par l'INHA, donc une série de conférences dont la prochaine sera sur l'école de photographie de Kharkiv. Voilà. Merci à vous. Bonne soirée.